And I am also honored to introduce our afternoon keynote speaker, Dr. Andy Malinsky, a colleague of mine who we met years ago and um, very impressed and we wanted Andy to come and speak to you. Andy will talk a little bit more about his own background. Needless to say, Andy is an expert in the idea of global dexterity. He's a professor of organizational behavior and international management at Brandeis University in Boston. He is a top voice, a thought leader in this area, and we're so very excited to have him come and speak to us about how teams develop, grow, um, particularly in this world of complex cultural um, intersections. Um, Dr. Malinsky also has a booth at the Conference Marketplace, which you may want to visit during noontime. Andy's presentation is entitled Global Dexterity, How to Adapt Your Behavior Across Cultures Without Losing Yourself in the Process, something that we all work on each and every day, to be followed by a moderated question and answer period. Take it away, Dr. Malinsky. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'm very happy to be here to talk with you today about global dexterity. Um, so I actually want to start today, before we even talk about global dexterity, I want to talk about something called glocalization, which I imagine some of you have heard of. It's the idea that companies nowadays, uh, and for much longer than nowadays, have been going global, but at the same time, it's been critical to be responsive to the local context. So um, I'm American. Here's a American example, uh, McDonald's. Uh, and when McDonald's went into India, the all beef patty Big Mac was not gonna work because of the relationship with, with, between India and, and, and cows and meat. Um, and so therefore they created the chicken Maharaja Mac and the McVeggie, an example of glocalization. Um, another example, the Kit Kat. I have to admit, this is one of my favorite all time uh, treats. Um, whenever my kids go out for Halloween, it's the first thing I always steal from their bag, their Kit Kats. Uh, again, another example of glocalization um, in, in Asia, in Japan and in other places in Asia. And frankly, here too, in North America, you can oftentimes find strawberry cheesecake Kit Kats, soybean Kit Kats, green tea Kit Kats, fruit parfait Kit Kats, and more. That's another example of glocalization. Um, funny story, I, I gave a keynote talk at a company a couple years ago, um, and I used this slide, and I got a very nice package a couple weeks later of some green tea Kit Kats, which I enjoyed, and I also enjoyed giving my students. Um, one last example I'll give you. Um, and this is really a quintessential American example, a quintessential Boston example where I am. Uh, Dunkin' Donuts. The original Dunkin' Donuts actually was in Quincy, Massachusetts, which is, gosh, about 20 minutes from where I am speaking uh, with you right now. I remember um, fondly when I was a kid, occasionally, maybe maybe once or twice a month on a weekend, my dad would take me um, to, to Dunkin' Donuts and would get a, maybe get a half dozen or a dozen glazed donuts. That was my favorite, those glazed donuts. Another example of glocalization, Dunkin' Donuts, let's say going into China and, and, and making um, uh, pork floss donuts, which by the way, for my Chinese students and colleagues I hear are good. Um, the, the kimchi croquette in Korea, um, I've met fewer people who have tried it, and I, I love kimchi, but I have to, I don't know if I really like it in my donuts. Um, so, so, so in summary here, and this is really just a precursor to what we're going to talk about with um, global dexterity, the idea of globalization at the company level is the idea that companies need to be responsive to the local context when doing global work, but at the same time, um, adjust to, uh, to, to, I'm sorry, they need to, um, maintain their brand integrity. In other words, they do need to adjust to the local context, but they can't lose who they are in the process. That's the idea that I'm trying to get at here, which is actually a very nice um, analogy to global dexterity. And that's why I bring this up. So from companies to people, if globalization is companies adapting and adjusting to different cultures, uh, but at the same time, um, 
adapting to local tastes and maintaining the brand integrity. Same thing is true with global dexterity, individual people adapting and adjusting their behavior across cultures and at the same time attempting to maintain their own personal integrity. That's the connection that I wanted to make here. Um, so, so, so what is global dexterity? It's the ability to adapt your behavior smoothly and successfully to the demands of a foreign culture, but without losing yourself in the process. Uh, so there are two key parts of this, the smoothly and successfully part. That's the when in Rome, act like the Romans uh, idea. You need to be effective. You need to be appropriate in whatever context it might be, but without losing yourself in the process, trying to find a way to do it um, that feels authentic to you. Uh, and that's the essential trick of global dexterity. So when I start talking about global dexterity, I like to talk a little bit first about cultural adaptation. And I, the, the way I see the world of cultural adaptation, I'm a fairly simple guy. I like to see it in terms of two different classes or types of, of, of cultural adaptation, kind of easy cases and harder cases. Um, and, and this is what I would say is probably a fairly easy case. Uh, if, if, if we were all in a room together, uh, ho hopefully in the future we might be. Um, what, I, what we would do is I would invite someone down from the, from the audience to, to practice exchanging business cards in Japan. Um, and, and we'd talk about how when you exchange business cards in Japan, you need to hold the card with two hands, you need to uh, bow slightly, uh, you need to uh, point the lettering of the card to face the person receiving it. And then when you do receive the card, you don't stick it in your pocket, you don't write on it, and so on like I might do actually at a conference. I do that all the time. If I'm collecting 20, 30 business cards, I might write on the back, you know, remember to uh, email John copy of report or something. But in Japan, no, the business card in, in, in essence is almost like like an extension of the person and you need to treat it with respect. Um, and, and then I, and, and, and you can imagine how this would be done in the United States or Canada, for instance. Um, and and the, the reason that I call this an easy case is because we just learned how to do it, right? It probably doesn't conflict in any deep fundamental way with your cultural values or norms. Um, and, and so there are some other easy cases of cultural adaptation I'll, I'll, I'll show you just, just, just for fun. Um, uh, these are from uh, American political culture, actually. Upper left-hand corner, you've got Nixon going to China. I'm in the 70s. I imagine he didn't typically eat with chopsticks uh, at, at home in California, I think where he was from, or Washington, D.C., but he seemed to have made the switch. Um, bottom left-hand corner, you've got George W. Bush with a former Saudi king um, holding hands. I, I, I don't imagine that George W. Bush would hold hands with, with um, his, his buddies in Texas, uh, his business associates and so on, uh, even his American political colleagues, uh, but he seems to be adjusting quite well. Uh, um, uh, President Obama, uh, Barack Obama kissing Carly Bruni. I'm guessing, if I had to guess, I would guess that uh, Obama was probably more of a handshake or a hug guy. A lot of Americans are huggers. Um, he learned the, the, the two kisses, uh, or is it three kisses, right? I, I actually lived in France, and I, I remember trying to master this ritual. You know, how many cheeks, how many kisses do I make that sound? You know, like, what, what <laughs> how do you do it? I felt, I felt a little awkward, but, but it didn't, it was easy to learn, essentially. It, it was not, I wouldn't classify it as a super hard uh, case of cultural adaptation. And then the bottom right-hand corner, you've got the Clintons when Bill was president, uh, and they're in Ghana wearing uh, different clothing, for sure, than they, than they would have in the United States. Um, my point here, though, is that... Um, the, the, if, you, if you had a pie chart about like the, the, the amount of situations people encounter in their everyday uh, personal, professional lives um, with cultural differences, I, I would guess that a larger proportion of the pie has to do with harder cases, uh, especially those important cases, um, uh, everyday moments uh, in the job search or on the job where where in order to be effective and appropriate, you might have to do something that is a deeper threat to who you are. Uh, being assertive, if for instance, if you come from a culture where you were taught your whole life to speak only when spoken to, uh, promoting yourself, 
when you come from a very modest culture and it's very uncomfortable for you to try to promote and pitch yourself uh, to a potential employer. I mean, someone who's senior to you, even more so difficult, delivering a presentation, giving feedback. There are many everyday activities that pose a, a stronger cultural uh, and psychological threat. Um, here are a couple of examples, just quick examples. Um, this is um, from my research actually. This is an Indian MBA student who is learning to self-promote in a networking event. And this is his quote about it in the United States. I, I feel that I'm performing a sin. He's talking about pitching and promoting himself, trying to be something that I am not, being artificial and fake. I try to sell myself, bragging, that's how he feels, right? Bragging about my abilities to a stranger. And that feels so weird and selfish to me. It makes me feel like I am doing things to achieve my objectives at all costs. One quick other example, this is an American going to Germany. It's an American consultant. I remember interviewing him for my book, Global Dexterity, and I asked him, what was the hardest thing about going to Germany? And he, without missing a beat, he told me it was giving feedback because in Germany, there's no preamble, no protecting anyone's ego like in the United States with the feedback sandwich, maybe you've heard of perhaps in Canada as well, where you might soften that feedback a bit. But in Germany, it's just that blunt direct message of, I don't like that, or that won't work. And for him coming from the United States, he was more, he also his personality, more of a people pleaser. It was very hard for him to make that adaptation. So overall, I see, uh, three challenges popping up time and time again. I call these psychological challenges, um, um, internal challenges people face, even when they know how to do something, translating that knowledge into behavior in a real situation. Um, I call them the authenticity challenge, the idea that, th that this isn't me, this doesn't feel like me. Uh, and that can create anxiety, distress, guilt, um, uh, I'm acting against my personality, perhaps, um, uh, or, or what I was taught. Um, uh, co the competence challenge, um, that's the idea that, that I'm not good at this, or I don't feel I'm good at this. And plus, there's a public side of it. What if others see me as not being good at this can create anxiety and embarrassment? And then, 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 then the resentment challenge. Now, um, logically, you might know when in Rome act like the Romans, but psychologically, you can feel frustrated that you have that you have to do this. Like, I have to make small talk with a potential employer when in my culture, you'd never do that. And that's what's going to enable me to create quick trust and rapport that's necessary for a job. That's frustrating. It's not my CV. It's not all my accomplishments. So, so there you go. Um, those, those psychological challenges um, can create what I call psychological toll, which is a burden you carry with you. And it's very difficult to be flexible, global dexterity, be flexible when you're feeling such um, emotional psychological toll. And so, so, so that's the paradox. How do you be flexible under the very circumstances, high emotional toll, that make it very hard to be flexible? So, now, if I stopped here, this would be a really kind of depressing talk. <laughs> so, uh, and if, certainly in my book and in my work, and my I, I have a um, train the trainer program I have where I teach coaches and consultants and trainers how to use global dexterity. I've done a lot of consulting and training myself and so on. So how do you do it? Um, I'm going to give you a quick snapshot into, into how you do it, how you enable someone or yourself to step outside your cultural comfort zone, but without losing yourself in the process. Um, four steps. Uh, we'll talk about them in order. The first is to diagnose what I call the new cultural code. So you're in a situation, in a new culture, what are the rules of the road? How do I have to act in this situation? And how does that compare to how I would have acted in my own culture in a very similar situation? Um, I have created a framework uh, to diagnose the cultural code with six dimensions to it. Uh, you can see them here. You can take any situation in the world and you can explain them in terms of the code for this situation in this culture, in this setting perhaps even in this company. Um, directness, uh, enthusiasm, formality, assertiveness, self-promotion, and personal disclosure. What's the code in this particular situation? And then of course, how does it differ from your default code? Um, here's an example. Now, I'm just gonna go back for a second. There's six dimensions here, but I'm just gonna look at three quickly. 
Um, and we're going to use a situation. We'll use this situation actually for, for another example too. Describing achievements to your boss. Um, let's compare the Indian code to the American code. Now, granted, the US is a very diverse country. India, perhaps even more diverse, probably more diverse. So I'm, we're painting with broad brush strokes here in terms of the general code uh, in situations, in terms of describing achievements to your boss. But, but, but in reality, the general code is very different. Look at the differences. Enthusiasm. In the US, it's appropriate. It's expected to show enthusiasm. Whereas in India, typically, American style enthusiasm is inappropriate for such a, a serious and formal discussion. Assertiveness. In the US, you want to be seen as a go-getter, right? Uh, that's, that's, the, that's the standard, let's say, typical standard. In India, American style assertiveness is often too aggressive. You, you actually want to show deference in composure, that's the queen of the realm uh, in, in India. And then self-promotion, you can, you can guess here about the difference between the US and India. Um, so, so that's diagnosing the new code. It's a very flexible tool you can use in any situation in any culture. But the key then is to identify your own personal challenges. What are your pain points with respect to the code? Um, let's, let's use the same situation and, and let's introduce a character. We'll call him Sandeep um, and we'll also introduce some language. So his personal comfort zone, that's, that's a, a term I use um, to describe your, where you feel comfortable in the range of the code. So it turns out that Sandeep is very prototypically Indian in this respect. He does not feel comfortable promoting himself. So you'd maybe say, is a one or a two. Well, what's the American zone of appropriateness? How do you have to act in the U.S.? Now, it's funny because the stereotype might be a seven or an eight or a nine, <laughs> but I'd say it's probably between a four and a six somewhere, depending on other factors. But, but either way, there's a gap. You see the gap between the, the, the two and the four, for instance. Um, now, imagine, though, that Sandeep has a friend named Raj, just, just as a thought exercise. Um, both were born in India, but, but Raj was raised, let's say, in a bike cultural household. Let's say his father is British. Um, and let's say he, he has a mix of family values. And let's say he decided to go to Harvard University or McGill uh, University or Queens University or UBC or wherever it might be. Um, now, the question here is before uh, Sandeep's personal comfort zone, let's say was a one or a two. What do you think Raj's would be given the story here? Um, now, these are characters. So we're kind of making this up. But my suspicion is Raj would have a wider uh, range. So he could feel comfortable at a one or a two, but also at a three, four or five. And you can see there would therefore be an overlap between, not a gap, but an overlap between his personal comfort zone and the zone of appropriateness in the US, meaning just wouldn't be that hard for Raj, right? So, so, th so, so that's how you can play around with that idea. Um, the third step, and this is the most important step of all, uh, this is how you get that authenticity piece in. So you customize. Um, oftentimes, I, people, when I speak to them, have this, I, they sort of have an implicit assumption that you have to hit that, that bullseye of the archery target when you're adapting behavior across cultures. You have to do it perfectly. But what I've found is really that there's a range and you just need to find a place somewhere in that range. You can be appropriate and authentic enough at the same time. And, and, and I, I like to use some analogies to describe this. One is like a tailor, like when you buy a suit or a shirt or a pair of pants or a dress, oftentimes it doesn't fit you right off the rack. And you have to have it adjusted just a little bit. And that's the same thing you can do with culture. Um, another analogy I like to use is that adapting behavior across cultures is like being a fusion chef. Uh, fusion cuisine is big where I am in Boston. Um, and these are some examples of fusion chefs. Kat Cora, who is from the south of the United States, but also has Greek heritage. And then Wolfgang Puck was almost like the quintessential fusion chef using European sensibilities with California fresh ingredients. Um, uh, you can see a lot of these cultural fusions in the food world. Uh, take creme brulee and add cardamom, and you've got cardamom creme brulee. Take kimchi. You can see, you know, I was probably hungry writing this presentation, adding it to a burrito, and you've got a kimchi burrito. N now, 
not all fusions work. You can't just throw together ingredients, right? There's an art to this, to getting it right. Uh, but the point is, is that you can, you, you can often do it. Um, uh, and just here's a quick example of Sandeep's cultural fusion. Um, I just want to really emphasize the first three um, elements. Um, he, he, this is a real person, by the way. He started talking about his personal accomplishments, but he also would emphasize the team. So he would talk about how proud he was to have been able to do X, Y, or Z to support the team in the goals of the organization. So he would talk about the organization, its goals, the team, but also himself. By the way, prior to doing this, he would only talk about the team and the organization. And it was, it was, um, it was hard to understand where he was in the story. Okay, final step is to make the behavior into muscle memory, just like anything that you're learning outside your cultural comfort zone. Uh, athletes do this, of course, with repetitive action. Uh, it's important to practice in realistic settings, uh, to get and give yourself feedback. That's really important. Um, in my book, Global Dexterity, I talk about two kinds of feedback. One is your external scorecard. In other words, have someone else be able to observe you in a situation and help identify where specifically you need to work in order to be more effective and appropriate in terms of your external presentation. Um, and I use the dimensions we talked about earlier. So in this case, this person's pretty good on directness, but maybe a little bit too assertive. Um, and then I also talk about an internal scorecard. We talked about authenticity, remember? So you rate this for yourself. How comfortable were you? And, and for this person, um, it's, it seems that in terms of assertiveness, they're moderately comfortable, directness, not so much. And what's nice about this sort of um, uh, more targeted way of assessing, um, uh, of, of, of getting and delivering your own feedback is that um, it's specific and it can identify where particularly you need to work. And I find this a very useful tool uh, in helping people step outside their cultural comfort zone and develop uh, global dexterity. Uh, and then finally, um, uh, your overall goal here uh, is, to, is to hit that, that upper left-hand quadrant. Um, you're not going to be there all the time. In fact, there'll be situations where you aren't there at all. You might face what I call a double challenge, a bottom right hand. Uh, you might feel incompetent and inauthentic in a situation. But through these tools, uh, you can move to, 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 the, to, to the comfort zone. That, that, that's the goal. And, and so I wanna end here with, with just a quick summary of, of some key ideas, um, that being effective across cultures isn't just learning about differences. So important. Um, it's, it's about learning to adapt and adjust your behavior in light of these differences. Um, people face three core challenges. We talked about those, authenticity, competence, and resentment. And you can overcome these challenges in four doable steps. Uh, and these are the steps that we just outlined earlier. Um, so that's it. That's global dexterity. Thank you very much.